Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for sticking around uh, for what's been a great day so far. I've really enjoyed seeing all the other presentations uh, and, and hope to yeah add, add to that as well. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about ca power calculations for aging research. Um, so to give just a kind of a quick overview of where we're going to go, um, let's start by just with an introduction to statistical power and power calculations. Talk about power calculations with individual level randomization. Um, so this is, again, kind of the traditional sort of textbook approach that I think is often taught. Um, Alex's talk this morning with declared design was really interesting to see as another framework for being able to use that, which I think is very complementary. But this will be a little bit more of the kind of like the yeah the what you may or may not have been taught um, sometimes times in SAT programs with a lot of uh, kind of intuition and and some practical applications as we go through from there. Um, we'll talk through kind of a, a hypothetical example and then uh, talk about a few additional considerations that we may want to bring in um, through power calculations. Um, and so then kind of wrap up with uh, some practi practical tips. Um, so just kind of a disclaimer for how I'm coming at this, like my background is in economics, particularly development economics. So that's the kind of the, the, the angle and the way that I have mostly internalized this. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to any feedback that you may have about other ways that I should be thinking about this or, or things like that as we go forward as well. Um, so I, yeah, I, I'm new to the aging space. That's kind of an area with um, the Kenya Life Panel Survey with Ted and Alden that we're kind of expanding some of these directions. So I, I've been learning a lot about that so far, um, but, uh, but yeah, that's still a little bit of a newer area for me. Um, and then kind of as we were hearing before about the kind of dis differences and disciplines with kind of health research reporting and things like that, the aging space is very broad. There's kind of work going on in genomics and things like that, which may have um, kind of potentially varying conventions around statistical power and how that's calculated. So this is, I'm kind of coming at it from the economics background. So take that with a grain of salt um, if, there, if there's aspects that are relevant or not relevant to you. Um, and then please let me know because I would, I would like to discuss that more. So um, when we think about conducting experiments uh, or studies more broadly, we do want to know kind of what is our sensitivity to be able to detect differences between the groups. So are we able to detect an effect of a particular size? So often we think about this as differences between, say, in an experiment, a treatment and control group, but this could also be differences between treatment arms within an experiment or between subgroups um, that are within the treatment group, say men versus women or older versus younger, younger respondents. There's a ver variety of reasons why kind of designing well powdered experiments are important. We want to make sure that we're able to detect meaningful effects. And so here, when we think about what is a meaningful effect, uh, that can, it's very subjective in many cases, but we want it to be something that kind of moves the literature of a particular area forward, is matter is something that matters for a particular decision that a policymaker may be making or that a program um, officer may be deciding whether or not we should scale up this intervention or whether or not we should kind of expand to a new area. We, we need to be able to kind of know what is a meaningful effect in each of those contexts. In some cases, that's gonna depend on what is the cost of this intervention. In other cases, you know, if you're a researcher, it may be sort of like what, from a meta an analytic perspective, what is the range of effect sizes that we're seeing and can we use that to kind of infer what we think is gonna be a meaningful effect in this case? Um, so, you know, if we have a study that's underpowered, we may conclude that a program that is actually has an effect, um, has no effect. And so that would be that would be an error that we don't wanna make. At the same time, you know, if we increase our sample size, like that is going to increase our statistical power, but we wanna make sure that we're designing studies that have the kind of, uh, where, you know, making efficient use of our resources. So if there is a particular minimum defect, uh, detectable effect that we wanna target, we don't wanna waste a ton of research, resources, um, both in terms of researcher and participant time, in terms of treatment costs, uh, designing a study that is going to be way too powered to detect a particular effect from that side. Um, and then I think power calculations are one area that both in kind of studies and pre-analysis plans and uh, grant applications are frequently not very transparent. Um, and so I think that this is really an area that we want to kind of think clearly about and to kind of be, uh, be very clear about our assumptions. And again, that's something with the declared design that was you really have to lay out. This is exactly, exactly what, we, what we were thinking about all these different pieces. In many cases, we are having to make assumptions. You know, are all these models are going to be wrong in some sense, but we need to kind of at least kind of put forward this is <laughs> this is the model of the world that world that we're working with. This is the way, again, even if we're doing these kind of traditional standard power calculations, this is the world that we're operating in. These are the effect sizes that we're thinking about. This is the minimum de detectable effect that we think is reasonable and kind of making making our case for that. Um, so I think that's just one area to kind of keep in mind. Uh, I'm not going to touch on that a ton throughout the rest of this talk, 
but that is something just to keep in mind throughout the rest of um, the, the session and, uh, and, the, and this training is kind of how, how can we do more in that space uh, to make power calculations more trans transparent. Um, so again, kind of a, a standard null hypothesis testing framework. Um, let's say we want to evaluate an, in, uh, an intervention with a, an RCT. So by convention, we usually propose two hypotheses. There'll be a null hypothesis of a treatment effect of zero and an alternate or sometimes research hypothesis, depending on terminology, that there's a, the, the treatment effect is not zero. Again, by convention, we're usually testing two-sided hypotheses. So this is a, that whether or not effects are very positive or very negative. Um, that's usually done for symmetry. At times, we may be interested in only one-sided tests, um, again, but all the logic is going to be very similar kind of through that. And so we'll talk a little bit about how, how that affects power um, as we go forward. So we have some data. Well, we, we, we run our calculations. We test the null hypothesis to get a p-value, the probability that it, uh, uh, kind of obtaining the observed outcomes if the null hypothesis were true. So again, because we're assuming zero effect, that means that we kind of would affect the, the expect the effect of the intervention to be zero, so we can kind of compare things against that. Um, and then we want need to set some sort of threshold for our statistical inference. And so this is um, we usually do that in terms of thinking about we want to avoid making uh, kind of assigning false positives. So you choose a uh, an alpha value or critical value, typically of 0 0.05. Um, and so if the p value is less than this critical value, we reject the null hypothesis. Otherwise, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. When we fail to reject the null hypothesis, that doesn't give us a lot of information. You know, is this because the true effect is zero? Is it because we had, uh, uh, you know, we were weakly powered, we weren't actually able to detect an effect? We, we kind of need to interrogate that a little bit more. Um, but generally, it kind of gives us four different states of the world. So we have um, kind of on, on the rows, these are the kind of the results of our statistical inference. So is the observed effect statistically significant? If it is, we can reject the null hypothesis. If it's not significant, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Then we can compare this to the underlying truth. So again, suppose we know the state of the world, we know that there is a there is or is not a true effect. If there is a treatment effect, the null hypothesis is false. If there's no treatment effect, the null hypothesis is true. And so these are each of the columns. So in the kind of the first square here, that's like the true positive. So this is the the kind of the probability that we uh, or the true positive again, where we have we are able to reject for a true treatment effect. And so this is, again, what we want to think about as the statistical power. So the probability of attaining a true a positive and that we will detect a treatment effect when there is one. Likewise, again, we want to kind of avoid false positives, with the, um, which are type 1 errors. And we want to avoid false zeros, which are type 2 errors. So these are kind of the, all the terms that you kind of see, see thrown around. Um, often people use beta um, as the probability of a type 2 error. I'm using um, kappa here just because uh, I'm going to be talking about coefficients as beta, so just uh, if that, yeah, I think that makes it a little bit easier. Maybe make this make this table a little bit more confusing, but hopefully it will make everything else more confused, uh, more straightforward. Is there? So again, we, we want to try to wind up on the diagonal, um, avoid the off diagonal, but um, but these are all kind of parameters that we have to have to select, uh, and they're going to have implications for our power as we go forward. Um, so we can also see this graphically. And so um, this, this first kind of curve here is like the null hypothesis for an effect size of zero. Um, we've set a critical value alpha. Um, here it says it is 0.5. So again, for any effect size that we see that is above that critical value, we're going to wind up rejecting, um, uh, re rejecting the null hypothesis. This other curve here is, again, our, our kind of the distribution of effect sizes that we would see under the uh, kind of a true effect of beta star. Um, and so we're assuming that the true effect size, yeah, the true effect size is again is centered on beta star, and so the power again is the area of, that we're, we wind up rejecting um, for beta star when uh, when the that when we're getting the kind of the true effect size there. Um, so is this something that people have seen before? Is this this feels relatively relatively standard? Any questions before before kind of going forward from there? Okay, so. Um, when we think about what we want to calculate when, we, when we're doing cal power calculations, there's usually a couple different situations that occur. So the first situation is that we'll want to calculate the sample size that, we, that is needed to detect a desired minimum detectable effect, or MDE. The second situation is, say, we know we have a fixed sample size, and we want to figure out either what is the effect size or the power that we'd be able to use to detect a particular effect size within the, uh, the parameters of a fixed sample size. 
Um, by convention, studies are often seek to be powered at 80%. That's kind of the threshold that we often use. Sometimes we'll see 90% and, and different things. So this really leaves the effect size as the, var the variable that is left to be determined for, um, for these types of calculations, if we're gonna assume a power of 80%. Um, so again, the, the type of approach, like, so if we wanted to think about um, when we would wanna calculate uh, the sample size needed, it may be that say there's a health intervention and we know it's gonna be cost effective if it approves an outcome by 10%. So here we know that we wanna be able to make a decision that we're gonna uh, kind of implement this program if we, if we see an improvement of 10%. So that's what we could use as a minimum detectable effect size. And so then we would be asking ourselves, what is the sample size that we need in order to detect that effect and can kind of do calculations accordingly. At the same time, in other situations, we may have a fixed sample size. So say that there's you know, 400 patients that are over 55 in a clinic that could be candidates for a study. So this is our sample size is fixed, but then we may wanna know what is the kind of effect size that we could, that could be obtained with 80% power and so then that we would be able to use, is that effect size reasonable or is that not reasonable? Is that gonna be kind of too large to be, to be worth, worth undertaking a study to determine whether or not we wanna go forward? We could also think about if we need to see an effect size of 10%, or how well powered are we? What is the power level that we'd have for that? And again, if we're in the range of you know, 80 to 90%, we may think that, okay, this is justification enough to go forward. Um, if not, we may need to think about other ways to, to design a study or ways to increase our sample size um, from there. Um, so we've already talked about a few of these components, but just to kind of to, to define a few terms. Um, again, we have the significance of the test, the probability the alpha, the probability of committing a type one error, which we usually set to point, uh, 0 0.05. We have the power, the, the probability of avoiding type two errors or falsely failing to reject the null, which is often set at 0.8. The minimum detectable effect. So formally, this is the smallest effect that if it's true, uh, we are powered, uh, we have a, you know, the, the power chance of uh, producing an effect that is statistically estimate, uh, statistically significant at our uh, critical value. So again, anything that's below the minimum detectable effect, we may not be able to detect a statistically significant effect, even if the true effect is different than zero. Our sample size is our number, number of observations. Um, we also care about the residual or the variance of the outcome variable or the residual variance of the outcome variable, depending on whether or not we have co covariates available to us. Um, we can also manipulate the, the treatment allocation or PEEP. And so this is the proportion of a sample that is assigned to the tr treatment group. And so again, typically when we think about randomized controlled trials, we're usually thinking about half of is assigned to treatment and half is assigned to control, but there may be some cases where we wanna deviate from that. For instance, if we have a fixed budget for both the intervention and for the data collection, we wanna think about again, how are the, what are the costs associated with that? And in that case, like if the intervention is very expensive, we may want to assign a slightly a smaller share of people to the treatment group than to the control group in order to be able to maximize our power in those cases. Also, if we think that, that there's going to be very large variation from the treatment effect and kind of how that affects the, the variation in within the treatment group, we may want to adjust our, our the kind of the proportions that we're assigning there. Um, any questions so far? Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's very subjective, and I think that well, that's something that we'll kind of uh, continue to talk about. But uh, just you know, I think it is that's in some ways like the hardest thing to figure out of what you would want to be doing in terms of designing a study, and there's no. Uh, I, at least I have never heard of a good rule of thumb um, to be able to use kind of for this. I know that sometimes um, in some spaces, there's the kind of these like Cohen's D's numbers around 0.2 being a small effect, you know, versus like other ones there, but this is, that's very ad hoc. And I think in many cases, those are actually not appropriate. And so it really behooves us to think a little bit more kind of carefully about like what we think is actually reasonable here. So again, I think the kind of we can try to look to other studies within the literature to sort of see if there's anything that's comparable. Again, if um, if there are kind of meta-analyses on something, I think then that's that's a case where we can start to think about like, okay, what is the size of an effect that would kind of think about shifting our priors and kind of make, make making us move in that particular direction. Um, but but yeah, but I think that like that's there's there's not like a if you're kind of doing something brand new, it's very hard to kind of think about like what you want to be what you want to be calculating there. <laughs> 
Um, I think this is also, you know, for all of these, we want to think about like how sensitive are our power calculations to these different parameters. So if you there's a lot of uncertainty about what the minimum detectable effect could be, we can try to run power calculations at a couple of different points along the distribution to then sort of see like, okay, how is this varying like across this range? And like, do we think that we think that, yeah, you know, it's, we aren't sure if we'll be able to see like a 0.1 effect, but we're pretty sure that, you know, that like the, the, the reasonable minimum de detectable effect is at least, you know, smaller than 0.2. And you can kind of run with the upper range and sort of see how, see how that varies and how your power varies through there. Um, so again, just to kind of show some of the intuition for how some of these things are shaping power graphically. So this is again, like our original setup that we were looking at before. And then um, if we think about a situation where we double the effect size, so double the true effect size, we're shifting the distribution of our beta star, beta star out um, to be two beta star, and this is increasing our power. So again, if you have a larger effect size, you're much more likely to be able to detect uh, detect the true effect. You're going to be much more much better powered. I think that this is um, this is one thing that we can think about when when thinking about how to design an intervention. Like if you think that you can come up, so say you have some flexibility around the intervention that you're trying to design. If you think that you can come up with an intervention that is more likely to have a large effect versus a small effect, that often means that you're more likely to be well powered. Um, Obviously, there can be con some constraints with that. You know, if you're thinking about providing cash transfers or financial assistance or something like that, giving more money is probably going to give you a larger effect, but that's also going to be more expensive intervention. And so, you know, you're kind of having to calibrate where is the right the right point on that to be policy relevant. Um, but again, this is just you yeah, kind of can see, uh, yeah. In general, if we can kind of find things that are going to give us a larger effect size, that those are going to be easier easier to evaluate um, with a given sample size. Um, so what happens if we increase the significance level? So this is, again, often our standard uh, critical value is uh, is 95%. Um, if we were either, either to shift to, say, a one-sided um, one sided test, which would lower the critical value that you're evaluating things at, or if you're willing to say, like, okay, we're going to set, we're going to accept 10% um, of, of a type 1 error rate instead, this is lowering the critical value that you need, and this is also going to uh, increase your power. So again, you're moving from this line to this line, and increasing the share, <coughs> excuse me, the share of, uh, of kind of actual true effects that you would wind up projecting. Um, when we think about increasing sample size, um, so this figure on the left is kind of considering a small sample size. So again, this is where we have a wider variance relative to on the left uh, for the estimated effects that we're picking up. Um, so as we increase our sample size, the distribution um, of, of the null and the treatment effect both get tighter. And so we can see from the null side, it's also shifting the critical, like where 5% of your distribution or the, the where the tail of your distribution for your critical value is going to be further to the left, allowing you to, to reject a wider set of, um, of kind of true, true hypotheses and increasing your power. So, this is going to hold true for anything that uh, kind of affects the residual uh, variation. So sample size being one of those, obtaining covariates being another one of them. Again, if you're doing something that's in a more homogeneous population where you're, you're kind of getting, uh, that's like another case where you may be able to have less re uh, residual variation relative to other things. So this is also where things like stratification and stuff like that can make, may come in, in into your overall distance. Okay, um, so yeah, any questions just yeah, on a few you know, example graphs to get a little bit of intuition? Okay, so when we think about the, the like looking at this analytically, um, so as before, we can reject uh, the, the null hypothesis if our kind of standardized effect size um, is greater than a certain uh, critical value. And so then we can use this to come up with the, the, the minimum detectable effect for a power of 80% with a fixed sample size, which is going to be your first equation there. Um, so again, the minimal, minimum detectable effect is going to be a function of um, these kind of critical values from the T distribution, um, as well as the share that we're assigning to treatment and the residual variation and the sample size. 
Um, so this is kind of very much in line with like the intuition that we were seeing before. So as we, you know, or we can rearrange this to, to look at a sample size as well. Um, but this is, these are all kind of going with the intuition before. So again, we're gonna see that the power is gonna be, the maximum values of power that we're gonna get are going to be the, uh, when we're kind of setting the, the share that is assigned to treatment uh, at 0.5. And again, as we kind of increase the sample size, this is gonna reduce the minimum detectable effect that we can see. As we reduce the variance, this is gonna increase the minimum detectable effect that we can see. Um, and likewise, as we um, kind of increase the minimum detectable effect, this is also gonna uh, reduce the sample size that we may need to have this. Um, so in, in practice, I think, you know, there's a lot of online or, you know, declare design, Stata, R, all these packages have programs that will kind of calculate these for us. Um, so it's not like we necessarily need to, to memorize these types of equations, but I think it does just help build a little bit of intuition for kind of where this is coming from and to see how some of these other design features wind up mattering. Um, so to kind of think about a quick example that we can use and kind of apply to this to this framework. Um, so depressive symptoms are uh, kind of a very important issue for the elderly and they're associated with uh, kind of declines in functional ability and later survey rounds for individuals that were depressed. Um, so this figure here is from a, a recent paper, paper by um, Apigee Banerjee and others um, looking at the prevalence of de depressive symptoms by gender, age and country. Um, across a variety of um, low and middle income countries with the U.S. as, as a comparison. And again, these rates are just very high um, in terms of the types of the, the share of individuals that are experiencing um, some form of uh, depressive symptoms. Um, and they're also, in, in many cases, slightly higher for women. Um, and so suppose that we have you know, an NGO that is interested in uh, developing a kind of a, a phone-based therapy intervention that it hopes will kind of in, uh, reduce depressive symptoms among the elderly. Um, so the NGO has done some calculations from their side um, and they've figured out that if the intervention results in a 0.2 standard deviation decrease in a standardized index of depressive symptoms, there's many kind of common scales that are, that are used for this that we could use to con construct something like that. It'll consider the intervention worthwhile to scale up, scale up and further pursue. Um, so this is the thing that we can think about, like how will we go about calculating the sample size that we would need? So here we have, we've been given the, uh, the minimum detectable effect that is gonna be of interest. Um, so again, in this case, we have, we have one that we can work with. We don't have to kind of make a judgment call from that side, um, but we can think about how we kind of need to pull the rest of the pieces together. So um, again, we have the minimum detectable effect. When we're using a standardized index like this, there's gonna be the, the variance is gonna be set equal to one. Um, we'll follow convention and use a, a crit alpha critical value of, um, 0.05 and a power of 80%. Since this is a phone-based intervention, it seems reasonable to expect that we could do an individual randomization. It also means that we could likely assign equal shares to the treatment and control groups in order to maximize power. Um, so kind of as we plug this into our analytical formula um, for, for, for the sample size, um, we can come up with a, a sample size that we need of 784 in total or 392 individuals in each treatment arm. So, Again, if we wanted, to, this is kind of a 0.2 standard deviation increase. In some ways, like that's a pretty big effect <laughs> to me. So, they, but it's a, we're we're kind of again in the ballpark of around 400 um, individuals that we need um, from that side under under these conditions. Um, and so that you know, even at a, a first pass, like that just helps us kind of get a sense of whether or not this is something that seems feasible. You know, okay, what would be the budget for a phone survey with 400 people or with with eight, you know, close to 800 people? Um, how should we be thinking about like the cost associated with that? Is that within the realms of what what our uh, what a, our study could do, um, or would we need to think about other things? The other thing is this is thinking about just you know one treatment versus control comparison. If we want to be thinking about, we also want to detect differences between male and female respondents. This would be kind of if, and if we wanted to be able to detect the same type of effect between them, then we would also need to have this number of individuals um, within each of those arms. The, the challenge I think that is also there is when we think about um, conducting, uh, you know, differences, heterogeneous treatment effects, um, many times the minimum detectable effect that we want to see there could often be smaller than what we would expect to see overall in a difference between treatment and control groups. And so from that side, if we're thinking that, okay, this is an intervention that even if it has to drive a big change in treatment effects, it may drive relatively small changes between everyone that's getting those treatment effects. And so if we really wanna be well-powered 
to, to be able to detect differences um, in, in certain aspects of heterogeneity. Sometimes that implies very small minimum detectable effects that we need to be able to see and very large sample sizes uh, to be able to wind up actually, actually detecting those. Um, so this is, again, something that has to be, we want to be thinking about this prospectively. We want to be thinking about like, what is the associated budget that we need to do? Do we really, you know, how much do we really care about some of these dimensions of heterogeneity? And I think that that's, there's important questions around that because if we think that, you know, there are disparities by certain types of categories, we do want to think about those heterogeneities and we do want to kind of like take that very seriously. But sometimes that may mean that we need to uh, kind of make sure that we're devoting uh, kind of sufficient resources to be able to detect those types of differences. Um, and so just kind of for context, if we were thinking about uh, trying to detect an effect of 0.15 standard deviations instead, um, we would need a sample size of close to 1400 individuals. So again, this is, you know, as, as, you, as you make changes to these minimum detectable, de detectable effects, the sample sizes that are needed can be very sensitive to that. And so that's just some, one example of how, again, it's a critical parameter. We also often don't have a lot of guidance on that. Um, and so it is something that we really want to kind of think very carefully about and, and, to, uh, and to come to a reaction. Yeah. So if you have a Yeah, so if, if, you, if you wanted to test, uh, again, between, I, I think there's a couple different ways that you could think about structuring that. So, so one would be to sort of say, okay, we want to test slightly, slightly different nuances between, between these two different arms. And maybe then we're okay deciding that we mostly want to be powered between the, the difference between both of those in the control group, but not necessarily between the two different treatment groups. And so that, that, that's going to kind of factor into some of that um, from there. So if we want to think about treatment versus control, that would be one kind of set of comparisons. But then we also may want to think about treatment one versus treatment two, and that would be another comparison that we need to think about. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. And so I think that, um, we, we, that I have a bullet on that later, but just happy to kind of jump into that now. So the, the way that I would think about it for something like this, um, partly it depends on whether or not you think it's going to be balanced or not. So if, you, if you're pretty confident that your treatment is going to be balanced or that attrition is going to be balanced, I think you can kind of think about that as like, okay, we're going to enroll a certain number of people. We're going to have some set of like those people that are going to attrit. And so we want to make sure that however many people, whatever share of people that we think we're going to trip, we still have the sample size that we need for our power calculations remaining after that attrition. So that could just be a matter of kind of scaling things up. If you think that there's going to be some reason why you might wind up with um, kind of imbalances uh, in attrition status, I think that's something that you really should be simulating. And you should be thinking about there's a, a variety of different ways that you could handle differential attrition. And you should be kind of thinking about like, okay, this is the way that I would think about what, that I think I would want to handle that. And like, these are the kind of the, the approaches that I would take to, to, to try to do that. But um, yeah, but that, I think that if you just think it's sort of, it's like, okay, we're, there's no real reason to think that treatment is going to affect attrition. We're just going to lose 10% of the people. We want to make sure that, you know, when we first do the, the kind of the project setup or project enrollment, that we're going to be able to kind of account for that down the line. Um, and that's an important thing to think through. Like sometimes we don't know how long we might want to follow up with people kind of going forward. And so like that's also something to kind of think about from, from a study design perspective. If you think that long-term effects are going to be really interesting, and yeah, maybe you're only doing your power calculations to look a year and a half out now, but you think you might want to look five years out, you want to be thinking about that kind of like at, at that phase to make sure you're kind of set up well to be able to, to look at something along those lines. Um, and so um, yeah, we'll can kind of come back to this again later, but I think the the other kind of key point to keep in mind with attrition is like you can account for it in your power calculations, but you can also think about how can we design a study that is going to have as little attrition as possible. And so like that is probably going to be like your best way <laughs> to improve improve your uh, improve your statistical power. Um, so for instance, in um, one of the the Kenya Life Panel Survey project that that I'm involved in we have like a very detailed module of contact information that we collect every time. And it like, it pains me because I have so many other research questions that I want to address, but like every time it's like, okay, 
it's 10 to 15 minutes that we're just going to spend like taking contact information for these people so that we can follow up with them. And so, yeah, it's like, I would really like to get those extra, extra other survey topics in, but like that, that's the kind of the trade-off that we've decided to make so that we can kind of continue following up with people over time. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I'm. I think off the top of my head, I'm pretty sure it's the inverse of the, the proportion of costs, like relative to that, is like how you want to adjust adjust from there. Um, but I, I can follow up with you if if I'm. Yeah, I'll double check and, and follow up afterwards. Okay. Um, so yeah, so a few other ways that we can kind of add in additional complexity to these types of calculations. Um, so first, kind of as we were talking about, uh, you know, take up non-compliance and attrition is one thing that's going to really matter. And then thinking through like, you know, what can we do to generate high compliance and low attrition in general is going to be probably our best approach along those sides. We'll talk a little bit about kind of adding repeated measures. And so this is where, you know, sometimes we may face trade-offs between adding additional participants versus adding additional observations for a given participant. And so kind of what, when do we get um, the most benefit from additional rounds of data? Uh, and then we can, we'll also talk a little bit about cluster randomized designs. So that's where we're, we're going now. So again, thinking about you know program take up and nutrition. So, health inter interventions, as many other interventions, may not always have complete take up. So you know if we were offering some sort of phone based therapy, it's unlikely that everyone in the treatment group will take advantage of this. So how much does this affect our power calculations? So if we define this lowercase p as the difference in take up between treatment and control groups, the minimum defect detectable effect is going to be lower um, by the inverse of that amount. So if we think about how, what that does for our sample size, that means that our uh, the needed sample size is inversely proportional to the square of, uh, of this rate. So, um, you know, if we think to, you know, say that we have say 90% um, take up instead of, uh, or, yeah, 90% take up instead of 100% take up, this is implying that we need roughly a 25% larger sample sizes with 100% compliance. And if it's only half instead that the sample size is four times as large. Um, so this can get to be like a, a very, a very big thing when we think of, we think about compliance there, and this kind of this goes sort of on both sides. So this is an example where we're thinking about the no one in the control group is getting this, and it's just how much people in the treatment group are taking this up. But it also applies if this is kind of something that is like available to everyone, and you know, say half of your everyone in your treatment group takes it up, but half of your control group takes it up as well. This is again reducing kind of like the effective sample size that you have to be able to to look at some of these differences. Um, so this is, again, where, where we want to think about what are the strategies that we can use to design a study that's going to have kind of like high compliance um, as we go through there. So that could be, you know, making sure that uh, we're kind of identifying the right population for a particular program. So, it, you know, maybe the low take up is because this is, you know, a program that people are, are actually that very, very interested in. Um, and so I think that it, at least... In development economics, like that's historically been the case for a lot of the microfinance literature. So it's like people want to do studies on microfinance. A bunch of people are offered loans, but only five to ten percent of the people actually like take up these loans. And so then you need to be offering these to a massive number of people if you actually want to be able to kind of get the sample, the, the kind of final sample size that you need in order to be able to detect these types of different types of differences. Um, okay. So then again, attrition, which we kind of already talked about, that reduces the sample size in the final analysis. And if we think it's going to be balanced, we can kind of scale up um, the numbers that we want to start out with um, at the, from, the, from the start. Um, so when we think about re repeated measures, so this is at least historically for development economics, um, the, the kind of the main model that has been used is like a single baseline and a single follow-up, or in some cases, just a single follow-up without even a baseline. Um, there are some benefits um, in, in even going kind of going beyond the chances of being able to trace out kind of the time course of treatment effects for including additional follow-up rounds, even if they're close together. And so in some cases, um, it may be uh, kind of, again, having a smaller sample size with many repeated measures may actually be larger, better than a larger sample size with only a single, a single follow-up measure. And so the times that repeated measures are going to lead to the greatest improvement in power are when autocorrelation of measures is low. 
Um, so this can be common with some types of health, uh, health conditions. So if you have a headache, and this is something where you're going to kind of, every time you ask someone like, oh, do you have a headache now? It's going to be a very noisy signal. But, you know, especially when we think about, you know, oh, if you're asking, did you have a headache in the last week? So on any particular week, you may have a lot of variation into whether or not you have that. But if you're collecting data for over the course of several months, this is going to be kind of like a single, uh, an opportunity to get, you know, uh, you can average across those and get a, get, a, get a better measure than you might if you were only asking kind of a bunch of people at one point in time. Um, at the same time, uh, if we think about when uh, for highly autocorrelated outcomes, um, that's when like a, a baseline measure can be especially useful. And so if you have things like in education, a lot of times test scores are something where it can be really helpful to be able to get a kind of a baseline measure of test scores, because um, that's going to be highly correlated with what we want to be doing down the line. Um, and so for some other types of health, health outcomes, um, if you think about something like height, like your height's very unlikely to change over time. Um, you know, I don't know exactly what intervention you would use to try to increase that, but at the same time, you know, if you kind of measure that at one point in time, that's going to be something that's going to be pretty stable, and so that can that can be kind of helpful to decide. Um, so I'm not going to kind of go into the exact calculate uh, the uh, kind of exact formulas for this, but there's a couple of resources here that will be available if you want to look into that. Okay, and so thinking about you know whether should we cluster or should we not cluster, and so. In some cases, uh, this is going to be kind of driven by um, just like the, the need of your randomized design. So if we're looking at, say, students within a school or classroom or patients within a clinic, sometimes it's just not going to be feasible to randomize at the individual level. And we're going to have to randomize classrooms or clinics or things like that in order to, to, to get at treatment effects. So depending on how similar observations are within clusters or groups, this can have a significant uh, implication for statistical, statistical power. So the more similar observations within a group are, the closer the number of effective observations that you have when you're looking at your study is to the number of clusters. So if I basically cloned a bunch of people within each classroom and they were all clones of one another, I really, the classroom is the only unit of analysis that I have when I'm kind of conducting my analysis. Um, at the same time, if there was no kind of if everyone within the classroom was not related or had no kind of common features or no, no inter-class correlation from there, then you would basically be in back in the, 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 the original individual, um, individual randomized world. Um, the other thing, um, and I, I don't think, well, I'm happy to discuss a little bit more later if we have time. Cluster randomized designs can be very useful to look at spillover effects. So if we assign different shares of units to treatment across different clusters, that's one way that we can start to see how um, treatment effects for a certain group of people may be affecting others that are untreated um, with, within a particular uh, cluster. Uh, so when we wind up randomizing into clusters, we're usually estimating regressions um, of, of the following form. And so here we have a particular outcome, Y, I, J. So for individual I and cluster J, um, our T is our treatment indicator. And so beta is our main coefficient of, in, uh, of interest. Uh, there's some covariates, um, as well as then a cluster-specific error term, the new J, and the individual-specific error term, the omega IJ. And so in this case, we're going to assume J clusters of equal size M. Um, so um, as, as we said before, we have these two different um, uh, error terms. And so if we want to calculate the variance of our estimated beta hat, this is then going to matter, it's going to depend on both of these terms. And so the intercluster correlation rho is the share of the total variation explained by the cluster level variance. So again, this is something that if all the variation is coming by variation in clusters, so in this case, we would have a row equal to, to one, everything has um, been from the cluster side, you really only have the number of observations of the cluster. Each, each cluster is like becomes basically your own only unit of observation. At the same time, if we set um, uh, if we set the cluster, excuse me, the cluster level variance to zero, we get back to our kind of our, our original form. Um, so th this brings us to uh, what's known as the design effect, and so this is how much less precise our estimate is for a given sample size when we move from an individual level to a cluster randomization. And so um, this is often denoted by D, um, which you can see kind of is the formula there, and how this really comes in is like now when we look at our minimum detectable effect equation, 
we have this extra term design effect, which winds up influencing um, the minimum detectable effect that we, can, that we can observe. And so, again, this is this is generally um, going to kind of increase or sorry decrease um, or yeah it sorry increase the minimum detectable effect that we'd be able to see uh, for any particular sample level. And so to kind of see this in practice, going back to our example from before, let's say that the NGO also wants to test out an in-person therapy option. And so to do that, they're going to work with providers from a clinic network, network to test out this program. So each clinic is going to have one therapist. And so there, it's only going to be possible to really kind of assign clinics to treatment or control, because it's going to be hard to kind of have therapists doing different types of things with different types of people. Um, so let's assume that the, there's 20 therapists that are available and that each therapist sees at least 50 patients that are eligible for the program. Um, the, the NGO has a lot of uncertainty around what the intercluster correlation is gonna be. So we're gonna explore how the uh, minimum detectable effect might vary around this. They think it's likely to be in the range of kind of 0.05 to 0.15. So <clears throat> what does this do to our minimum detectable effect size? So at uh, a row of 0.05, we're now getting uh, a minimum detectable effect of almost 0.33 standard deviations. Um, so if you recall from above, we were having a sample size of about 784 individuals in order to detect uh, an effect size of 0.2 standard deviations. So again, this is a very large increase in the minimum detectable effect, even though we're getting kind of 200 more patients available. If we move instead to an intercluster correlation of 0.15, this is even larger. We're only being able to detect a, um, effect size of 0.5 standard deviations. So this is really illustrating like clustering can really, really hurt your statistical power um, if, if, if that's the, the kind of a way that you have to go. And if you're kind of getting these um, intercluster correlations, like even in, even, even in these kind of ranges that seem, you know, some, sometimes work relatively well small. Yeah, so I think this is something that, again, if you do have data from a pilot or data from another study, like these are, these are things that you can kind of calculate. If you say you run a pilot with one clinic and you can kind of see like, okay, how similar are outcomes within within that clinic or, you know, with several with several clinics, like how kind of what, what, what does that look like over time? Um, it is another tricky parameter to kind of get at. And so I think this is like another case where kind of exploring how sensitive uh, again, like what are, what are the range of estimates that you that you would kind of need in order to be to be well powered? Or again, in many, many cases we have a fixed sample size, and so it's kind of just like, okay, do we feel comfortable moving forward with this experiment if you know we have to have an ICC of X in order for this to work? And sometimes like that X is very small, <laughs> and you can might be able to kind of just guess like, okay, like this doesn't really feel this doesn't feel reasonable, and so so we may need to think about well, what else we can do or what we can alter from, from a design perspective. Um, I think you could, I mean, I think that like, I I would usually be writing a pre-analysis plan after I had finalized a design. And so I think that like in that case, like I would wanna already know what my randomization was looking like in order to be able to kind of move forward from there. Um, that said, I think that like there there could be there could be scope for including discussions or caveats of like this is where again maybe being transparent with your cal power calculations helps. If you've said, hey, in our power calculations we assumed an intercluster correlation of this in order for this sample size to be viable. If it's much higher than this, this design is going to be underpowered. And you know you're kind of putting that up front, and maybe that kind of helps with down the line. You can kind of come back and sort of calculate your ICC and say, hey, look, actually, you know, actually we're underpowered here. We're not going to be able to kind of be as well powered for particular outcomes. Or again, maybe there's, you want to test three or four different outcomes. And, you know, that only really works um, if you, or, you know, only some of those work from, uh, depending on what, what the ICC is from there. And so, so there may be some scope to kind of, again, even out, outcome by outcome sort of say like, okay, depending on what we find from there, um, we'll see about that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is, 
yeah, I think I think that's a very fair point. That that's where it's like, okay, we, we need to budget for a pilot to <laughs> to do this in a couple of places and to kind of collect collect that data or to to really um, to really inform yeah to, to kind of figure out how we can kind of get that. Um, and yeah, well, I, I have a couple kind of tips about how I think about going through power calculations and how that relates to site design that um, I'll get to in just a second. And, and I think that that will inform a lot of that too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you would still need to kind of think about what you want to be able to detect. On that side, um, and that again, I think that if this spillover is the main thing that you want to be testing, like yeah, it would be a it would be behoove you to make sure that you are well powered to be able to, to detect that. And that's another case where again, I you know most cases your direct effect is going to be larger than your spillover effect, and so then we we're talking about smaller effect sizes that you that you need you know smaller true effects, and so that, again even larger sample sizes that you would need. Or something along along those lines. Okay, so kind of putting everything into practice, um, and so these are just a kind of a few kind of tips, you know, building on some of what we've seen here um, for thinking about how to design high power studies. So one, you know, we want to make sure we're choosing a good sample size. Larger samples will provide higher power. Um, so again, like if if someone comes to you and says like, oh, you know, I have I want to do this thing, but I only have a hundred participants. Then you, you know, we need to really think very carefully about like, okay, what are the assumptions that we need if we're going to only be able to kind of randomize that? Um, and again, in some cases, if you have, you think you're going to have a large uh, detectable effect, maybe that's okay. But uh, you really want to be kind of thinking about that up, up, up front. The the clustering point also kind of points to randomizing at the lowest level that's possible and appropriate. So. Um, again, if you sometimes the group level design is the best level is the best design, and you know that that's okay. We can we can work with that. But if you're thinking, you know, if it's like, oh, maybe this is something I'll just do for convenience. That's convenience. That's simply going to have um, kind of a yeah cause cause some a real increase um, in the detect the the size of the detectable effects that you'll be able to see. Um, we can also think about you know how many treatment groups do we really need. Um, so this is again kind of coming back to the, the question before. Of if we want to look at multiple treatment arms, that's again going to increase the the sample size that you need, um, and potentially can kind of you know if you're again if you have a fixed sample size that may be kind of coming at the cost of being able to pick up like the the one kind of treatment effect that you may care the most about. So so thinking about kind of how to prioritize that can be important. It's also you know important to think about how to design your study to try to inc increase compliance and lower attrition. Um, you may also want to kind of consider stratification or block randomization. So again, these are both strategies where if you have baseline data that you can kind of use um, and can kind of think about particular characteristics that may matter a lot um, for kind of uh, have causing variation in, in treatment effects, this is one way that you can kind of, uh, one, kind of set yourself up well for testing for heterogeneity, um, if that's something that you would be powered for, um, but also to kind of re reduce some of your residual variance. Um, and I think this kind of ties into some points that we've discussed a little bit earlier. Um, today, we want to carefully consider both measurement and the outcome variables. So sometimes with a study, we have a grand idea of like, okay, this intervention is going to affect this thing that is very important, but only tangentially related. Um, and so if there are a lot of steps in the causal chain to be able to get there, um, typically those are also going to be something where you're perhaps going to have smaller um, effect sizes that you think would be reasonable from that there. Um, whereas where you might have the most effect is kind of like on the first stage. So again, if we think about, um, you know, oh, we want to improve someone's uh, someone's overall health, like, yeah, okay, yeah, like, yeah, great, like, let's think about what we can do to that. But maybe we can kind of come up with something that is a little bit more well-tailored to, okay, we're offering an intervention around, you know, kind of promoting vaccination. Let's look at vaccination status. Like that is going to be like the next, the closest proximate thing that you're going to kind of be able to kind of see from there, and 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 may you know again that's one one example, but there may be other kind of situations that you can kind of come up with or think about along those along those similar lines. And this is also where, um, again, thinking about are we measuring things well also becomes really important. So again, if you have, uh, um, I think Alex gave the example earlier, if you have something where Again, you're 
winding up with like kind of zeros across the board for like the, the question that you're using as your to, to measure outcome, everyone is kind of responding with like a zero. So you have no variation in that whatsoever. Like that's gonna be really hard. If you if instead you can kind of think through and think about, okay, this is how we kind of come up with the right assessment to really measure the quantity that we're really trying to get at. That's also gonna be something that, you know, again is good science, but is also gonna kind of like help you maximize the chances of being able to pick up on the effects that you really want to actually be able to see. Um, so kind of coming back again to this point, we discussed a little bit already about like how to choose a, a minimum detectable effect. Again, this is one of the trickier aspects of study design, um, especially when we're thinking about something brand new. Um, there isn't like a kind of particular universal rule of thumb, but I think, you know, if we're coming at this with like kind of a researcher hat on, like one of the, some of the things that we can be thinking about are kind of what have other studies found, what would be interesting or publishable. Again, we don't always want to just be doing things because they're publishable, but that also can like help you think about like what would be the range of things that would you know be changing other people within your field's priors. Um, if we're kind of coming at this more from a policy or, or an implementer side, again, what's the smallest effect size that may be worthwhile to can continue a program or to scale up a particular policy? What would meet a cost benefit analysis? Or again, especially in the health case, what may be clinically relevant? So again, maybe there's kind of certain standards of care that have been adopted so far. And again, this is this is kind of how would we move the needle on, on, on where that would be that would be. Um, I think we've got kind of already talked about some of these kind of subgroup points that we, we may want to think about. Um, and then one other last point here is like when we want to think like many of these were we're using standardized effect sizes. And so I think that it can also be, if you're using say a continuous variable, that is something about like health expenditure. We also wanna think about like, what does that mean in terms of actual health expenditure, say in percentage effects? Um, Cause that can be another good way to sort of benchmark whether or not this effect seems reasonable. So it's like, oh, this is, you know, this is, this could be a say a 0.15 increase or, you know, or reduction say in, you know, your healthcare costs or something like that. But that may translate into a massive percentage effect. And so like, if that's the case, like maybe that's again, a sign that this is something that's gonna be actually unrealistic for us to be able to kind of detect uh, when, we, when we go to the data. Um, and so, you know, this is something where I often find it useful to do power calculations in two case, in two stages. And so this is kind of coming back to Alex's point a bit. And so with kind of the initial set of calculations, I see like the key goals are to one, get some sense of roughly whether or not the study is feasible and what are the kind of the critical assumptions and components that are gonna be most sensitive. Um, so again, if you know that your sample size is capped out at 500 participants and you know, for a minimum detectable effect that you think is reasonable, you need 1,500 participants, it's like, okay, we're done. You know, like you can play around with a lot of other things, but like this is, this is not gonna go forward. If you're in the situation where it's like, oh, okay, maybe this is feasible, but we have a really wide range of our ICC then in the second stage, this is where we want to think about like, okay, how do we come up with the numbers that can better inform these particular parameters in order to make a subsequent decision to be able to move forward? Um, and so in, in terms of thinking about, again, data sources that may help us inform power calculations, there may be other studies on these topics. This can, again, help inform all aspects, including uh, reasonable MDEs. Um, there's a lot of you know, existing data, data sets. We're going to see a talk tomorrow about the gateway to global aging which is a very nice resource that has a lot of harmonized aging related studies I mean, a very you know, easy to use in a digestible format that you, know, you could be pulling to kind of understand, again, at least like what does prevalence for these certain things look like? What, is, what do variants with, within certain populations look like? And then again, I think this is like a really clear case for pilot studies a lot of times in pilot data collection. So a lot of times, you know, not universally, but many grants don't require power calculations for pilot studies. So that's the, that is your chance to go and to collect the data that you need in order to be able to kind of conduct your power calculations to apply for a, a later larger grant that you can use to kind of actually carry out your full study. Um, so again, here, just a, kind of a few tools. Um, there's declared design, which again, I, this is, I was very excited to see. I think that's a, a really nice resource um, that, that really kind of pushes to, to formalize a lot of these other aspects of um, power calculations. Um, within Stata, uh, kind of more current versions of Stata, there's a new power command. Um, that you can use to kind of run a lot of these like the, the kind of standard standard types of things. In older versions, you had to use these SAMPSI and SAMP cluster commands. There's an R package called um, PWR. Optimal Design is another program that, at least when I was in grad school, people were kind of sometimes excited about. Um, it kind of created some nice visualizations around uh, around around power curves. Um, and again, you know, kind of take your pick of like your statistical software package. 
most of them have something that, that, that can be used for calculating power or that have the capacity, again, to be able to um, simulate whatever whatever kind of complicated designs you may, you may want to be able to use. And, and go from there. Okay, so I think that's, um, yeah, that's most of what I had there. I guess the one last thought, just because I know that there was a lot of, um, had a number of conversations about thinking about like observational data and, and, and how you might want to be thinking about that from that side. And so I think that the, the kind of the, the point here about like initial calculations as to whether or not something is feasible is also something that can be useful at times from observational data. Um, so it, particularly if you're waiting to kind of like get access to a data set or something along those lines, you still want to be able to kind of, you can still use that as a chance to think about like, okay, there was this policy change, how, you know, how large do I think that of an effect I, do I think it might have had? How large is this data set? Is that something that kind of seems like it would be reasonable um, to go from, from, from that point inside? Um, so again, it's, it's kind of, I think, uh, the broad principle with a lot of this is like kind of identify like the failure points for a study as early as possible and then use that to kind of iterate. So it's like, okay, if this is like something that I'm not going to be able to go, for, you know, don't take all of your time like cleaning this data set into something that's like nice and neat and has like the exact right outcome if you're actually, you know, it's very unrealistic that you'd be able to have a large enough sample size to detect the types of effects that you think you might, you might need. Great, I'll end there.